morning in Genesis chapter 2. As we're getting started, if you did not get a bulletin which has a study guide in it, will you raise your hand and our ushers are coming through to give you one. If you did not get it, just raise your hand and our ushers will get you a study guide. We want to be sure that you do not miss out on anything that we're covering this morning. Genesis chapter 2, we're going to read verses 15 through 17. Genesis chapter 2. Verses 15 through 17. If you're there and ready for me to read, say, I'm ready. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every, say the word every, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but... Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. We are putting a end, the final message, into this mini-series on created this morning. When we started this series, we talked about from the book of Genesis that God has created you and I to reflect the image of God. We gave great details of what it means to reflect that image of God and how we love God, how we serve Him how we love other people. Remember we read in the book of Genesis the account where when Adam was created the uh, God the Father, the Son and Holy Spirit said let us make man in our image. You and I have been created in the image of God. What the Puritans called the Imago Dei. And we gave great emphasis to how you can do that and why it's important that we do that. The next message we got into talking about that we were created to be responsible. Created to be responsible we talked about the fact that Adam was put in the garden to tend and to keep the garden. And we talked about the fact that all believers in Jesus Christ, all of mankind really, but we're keeping it personal to you and I this morning, that we've been created to be responsible. That we are supposed to be those that work. We're supposed to be those that provide for our families. And many other things that the Bible taught us during that time that we looked at it. And if you are unfamiliar or did not get a chance to participate, in those sermons. All of our Sunday morning sermons are available on YouTube channel at Abundant Life, o, Abundant Life Church OP. This morning as we finish out this series, we're going to be talking about this, that we are created to be relational. We are created to be relational. You were not created to do life alone. It was never God's plan. From the very beginning, we see that Adam, when he was created and put into the garden, God looked at him and said this, it's not good that man be alone. And then the Bible said he brought several uh, creatures in front of him and he named all of them. And after doing this long parade of naming all of the, uh, the, all of the animals from an elephant to a platypus, we find that after all of that was said and done, there was not a helpmate, a helper that was comparable. It was something still lacking and so God created woman for man created him so that he would not be alone and so that she would have a partner also in life we've all all been created to be in relationship with other people all of us there is no such a thing as an alone Christian if you're doing Christianity alone that's your fault not God's if you're doing life by yourself, it's your fault, not God's. God has provided every level of relationship that you and I need in order to not only fulfill our creative purpose, but to flourish in it also. And so this morning we're going to look at two primary ways that God created us for relational living. Let's begin with the first one, and that is this. We are created for covenant relationships. We are created for covenant relationship. The first one up to bat that we're going to talk about, and the most important one is this. We were created to be in a God covenant. We are created to be in a covenant with God. God made man. He made Adam. And they were enjoying each other in the cool of the day. It was someone that was uh, showing uh, through the creation of Adam who God is. It was this wonderful relationship. And God provided for him well. Think about this. He, pre he provided for Adam an entire garden and gave him this kind of liberty. You can eat of everything in this garden 
garden but one tree. Everything. Not, not just some of it. God didn't say, well, you know, 30% of the garden you can enjoy, but the other 70%, nope, hands off. No, everything. Let's really grab a hold of that this morning. In the second half of the message, it'll be even more important. Everything in this garden could be enjoyed by Adam except one thing. And God put him there and gave him this opportunity through free will to be obedient to him. Through free will to be able to have this relationship with God because a relationship where you choose one another is the most wonderful thing in the world. God chose Adam and God gave Adam the opportunity to choose him. To be in a covenant relationship with God. And you and I by virtue of being here this morning proves and shows to you this morning that you have a want to a desire to want to be in that kind of a covenant relationship with God where you're all of you all of God is what you want and God gets all of you that you have this exclusive relationship with God the second covenant relationship that we want to talk about this morning that picks up in verse number 18 and that is the marriage covenant the marriage covenant let's look at it together in verses 18 through 20 and it says this and the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. And every man said, <laughs> Ten of you are in trouble at lunch today. <laughs> And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. And the men said, Amen. there we go. That might redeem you a little bit. I tried to help you out there. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Verse 19, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and of every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every Every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. Grab a hold of this this morning. Adam had God, but God, through what is we read here in the scriptures, is showing that Adam needed something more and different. All was presented before Adam. At this point, Adam had a relationship with God. At this point, Adam had a face-to-face, -face, more, more so than you and I will ever be able to enjoy this side of glory. He had all of these creatures created that he was able to name. He knew them well enough to look at them and look at them and go, Oh yeah, you're an elephant. Oh yeah, you're a hyena. Oh yeah, yeah, a duck. That's perfect. That's what we need to call you, you know. Uh, catfish. Yeah, yeah, dude, I get it. The whole mustache thing, that's you, man, you know. <laughs> Adam named them all. And out of all of this vastness, and I'm, I'm, I say all those things because I'm trying to get you to grab a hold of the vastness of this. When we talk about garden, we're not talking about those three five-gallon buckets on your patio where you're growing tomatoes. We're talking a garden. Go to the largest, most beautiful botanical gardens on this planet, and it still would not compare to what God has provided here for Adam. And out of all of these things, Adam was still alone. And God said it wasn't good. And so the, so the solution for that was, it was showing him that he needed the woman, but then the solution for it was to give him the woman. Let's continue reading verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, therefore is in the Bible what? Therefore a reason. What we just read with the truth that God laid out for us is about to be amplified following the word therefore. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. The need was for this companion and the provision was actually giving that companion to Adam. I think this is one of the most beautiful passages of scripture of the creation account. Where God put someone into Adam's life that he was going to be able to enjoy this vast garden with. 
And listen to me, if you're sitting here this morning or you're watching us on the internet and you've got a spouse in your life, God has provided someone for you to enjoy the vastness of the life that you have. God has given you someone. I, I, I'm not going to point out who it was, but I just saw a very sweet gesture of a lady that just smiled and patted her husband on the leg, and they both smiled. <laughs> that couple, they get three golden stars, Pastor. They, I'll tell you later who they are, okay? You need to give them extra stars, all right? <laughs> and sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you guys. <laughs> they noticed. <laughs> God has given you that companion to enjoy this vastness of life that God gave. Now, I want to be sure that I'm crystal clear here. So if you are, even though sitting in the sanctuary, multitasking, if you're Christmas shopping early on Amazon because you're worried about the shipping containers off the coast, or if you're right now trying to text your children and be sure they turned off the crock pot before you get home, or whatever you're doing, come back to me for just a moment. Okay? Okay. Let me be crystal clear. At Abundant Life Church, we stand on the Word of God. Yeah, every, what the Bible calls every jot and every tittle of it, every crossing of every T and every dotting of every I, we believe and stand on the Word of God. So let me be very clear. God created them male and female, period. Amen. God didn't create them fluid. God didn't create them non-binary. God didn't create them with some bent toward the same sex that there's nothing they can do about. God created all of them, everyone on this planet since the beginning of time till the end of whenever God closes the curtain on the earthly lives lived here. They are only created, every human creation is only created either a male or a female, period. Period. I'm uncertain why that's even a challenge in the church of Jesus Christ. I know why it is. We're really rock solid about our theology until someone in our family declares differently. Then we adjust our theology for them. I've seen believers in Jesus Christ never question these verses that I just read right here. Then a 17-year-old daughter comes to him and says, Mom, Dad, I'm a lesbian. And all of a sudden, all theology goes out the door. Now all of a sudden, we've got parents combing the Scriptures and trying to find some way to prove fluidity of sexuality. Listen to me. There is no gray matter in this truth. It is as simple as it says, male and female, period. Are there perversions in this world where some people are tempted to the same sex? Of course there is. We live in a perverse, evil, wicked, sin-filled world. But God did not create them that way. They were created a man for a woman and a woman for a man, period. There is no question mark about this. Listen to me. Listen to me clearly. We at Abundant Life Church stand on the Word of God. So we stand on this clearly. Let me tell you what else we stand on clearly. That we love everyone. That we love everyone. Especially if you're watching on the internet. I want you to know that Abundant Life Church, we love everyone with the love of God. But we also stand for truth. And those aren't exclusive. We can do both at the same time. This church is always going to love anyone and everyone that ever comes through these doors. Including you if you're thinking about coming to this church. And we're going to do this as a church. We're going to love people. But we're not going to adjust our theology for it. We're not going to adjust truth for it. I understand the pain that must cause a parent 
to have a son or daughter come to them and say, I'm non-binary, or I, or I think I'm into women. A girl says she thinks she's into women, or a boy saying he thinks he's homosexual. Listen to me. You're doing nobody a favor, least of all, especially not your child, if in that moment you decide to adjust your theology to meet the whims of the world instead of the one who wrote it in the first place. Am I clear? Is the Bible clear? Good. Now we can move on. So God provided man uh, this companion of Eve. He gave her to him. And this is a beautiful encounter where God put him to sleep, took a rib from him. And I know all of the things that we talk about. He didn't take a, a part of Adam from his head or from his feet to where he'd rule over her to where she'd rule over him. But from his side to where to show this illustration, if you will, of this companionship. But Adam could... I, I don't believe Adam could have responded any better than he did when he saw her when he said this, this is now bone of my bones. We are one right now. This is flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man and because of this she's going to leave mother and father. Because of this I'm going to leave mother and father and cleave to one another. Now I know what your question is. Jonathan, pretty easy for them. No mom and dad were involved. <laughs> I saw it going on in your eyeballs, so let's deal with it, okay? God was setting up His instructions for the marriage and said, let me get it real clear right now that when you get married, your spouse and your marriage is now the primary relationship and parents are secondary. I didn't say you were going to like anything that I said this morning or that I'm still going to say. But I did step into this pulpit with confidence that I'll give you the truth. We're to leave mother and father and become one flesh with our companion. Pretty clear, isn't it? Yeah. So here we see the provision for the need was God gave Adam Eve. Before we walk away from this part of the covenant relationship, I want to make sure we cover one more thing in verse 25, and that is this. I want us to take a quick glimpse at the pre-state, the pre-fall state of marriage. Verse 25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. I want you to notice there how incredible that is with this sinlessness that was going on pre-fall before sin came into the, into the factor of marriage that the two of them were able to be so intimate, so in love with one another, so accepted by one another that the Bible uses the imagery of, which we know to be true because later they tried to clothe their nakedness, that they were naked and not ashamed. Sin brings Shame. Yeah. Perversion brings shame. That's why there's no place for it in the marriage. One man for one woman. God bless you. One man for one woman. Period. Doesn't matter. One man for one woman, period. The Bible says they were so in love with one another, so intimate with one another, because sin was not a factor. They were able to be naked and not ashamed. Before we move to the part two of this message, let me finish this covenant relationships with two additional truths about covenant relationships. And I put them on the PowerPoint because you're going to want to write these down or at least ponder them throughout the rest of this message in this afternoon. Number one, the covenant relationship with God is monotheistic. Pause right there and let me explain that to you. Monotheistic means one God. The day that Paul wrote in his day in the Roman, just to give you an idea, when you read Romans, 1 Corinthians, some of the other books Paul wrote, they were living in a very polytheistic culture. Poly meaning polytheistic, many gods. There was the God of the piano, the God of the carpet, the God of the sky, the God of the trees, all of these things. So when God came along through the New Testament, the Roman world initially embraced it because they were like, okay, well, the Christian God, so what? We'll just put him right up there, alphabetical order, Buddha God, Christian God. There we go, you know. It just includes included him into everything until the church started saying there was one true living God and all others are false. That's when the persecution came. 
That's when the difficulty for the church came. Monotheistic is what God meant from the very beginning of time, that there is one true God, and that is God. So let's look at this again. First, our covenant relationship with God is monotheistic. He is our one and only God that we serve, the one true living God. No other God's put before Him. And the marriage covenant is to be monogamous. One man for one woman, period. Not polyamorous, not three women and a man, or three men and a woman, or five men and four women, or any other combination that you want to put together. No. One man for one woman, period. Infidelity to one another. Second thing that I want us to see as we extend this truth of the covenant relationship, and that is this. The covenant relationship with God, that we have with God, instructs the covenant relationship of marriage. It's the foundation for what God instituted the marriage to be. We serve the one true living God. He's all ours and we're all His. The same thing is, is that same instruction is applied to the marriage covenant also. So let's read this one one more time. The covenant relationship with God instructs the covenant relationship with marriage while the marriage relationship illustrates the covenant relationship of God. You can find more on that if you want to write down, go back and reread and study Ephesians chapter 5. Second truth, the second part of this message this morning that I want us to delve into now. The first one is we were created for covenant relationships. Next up, we are created for community relationships. Community relationships. What is this kind of relationship? It is fellowship. It's the Greek word kononia. It means communion or sharing in common. In your study guide, I gave you the reference for this. I actually type the verses out for you so you can just follow along. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 47 says this. Then those who gladly received his word, this is the preaching of Simon Peter, were baptized, and, the, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. To them means to the church. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. In the breaking of bread and in prayers, then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done to the apostles. Now all who believed were together. You can link this back to verse 42 where it says fellowship. This is more explanation of that one word. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You and I are called to be in community relationships, and that means fellowship. Here's the struggle for you and I. We have narrowed fellowship down to just eating. That's what we, that's what we do. Let me illustrate it for you. Follow me, okay, where I'm going. If you go through those double doors or those double doors right there, you're entering into the part of the building. And I don't know all of my math or the square footage of this building, but that section of the building is probably anywhere between 15 and 20 percent of the square footage, maybe over there, something like that. Yeah, but he's not even going to help me out. Uh, 15, 20 percent of the square footage over there. And we call that the fellowship hall. That's where we go to have the fellowship. What's happened in Pentecostal circles is, is we consider fellowship only happening if we're around a casserole or God's favorite pie, coconut meringue pie. <laughs> Not cream. Don't, don't, don't mess up God's pie. Not cream. Coconut meringue pie. It's God's favorite. It happens to be my favorite, but it's God's favorite. It's part of my Be More Godly plan. We've relegated fellowship to in there. Let's make it more modern. We've relegated fellowship to Jose Peppers after church on Sunday night. They close early. They close early. That's right. We had to move up and switch all that out. We've relegated fellowship to Primetime Tuesday at Cracker Barrel. Fellowship is something that's done in far more ways 
than just having a casserole. It's called all things in common, communion, sharing with one another. And we read an extensive passage of Scripture from Acts 2 verse 41 all the way through to verse number 47 to show all the activities of this fellowship that's taking place. Not an exhaustive list or a, or, or a complete list, but a good starter for what it means to be in fellowship. So how do we accomplish this fellowship? Besides just eating together, we do it by doing all of the one another's in the Bible. Read your New Testament and mark in your Bible every time it says one another. Love one another. Pray for one another. Courage one another. Exhort one another. Bear one another's burdens. All of those one another's are part and parcel with this thing called fellowship. That means that when I pray with someone at the altar, a brother or sister in the Lord, I'm fellowshipping. If I'm in the foyer and I encourage somebody because I know they've had a bad week or I heard they did and I'm trying to give them a word of encouragement, I'm fellowshipping. When I love someone and I realize they've got a need going on in their life and I show up at their house to help with that need, a need to get something fixed at their house or to bring groceries or something other else, I'm fellowshipping with that brother or sister in the Lord. When I take the time to exhort someone that I love who's a brother or sister in the Lord, I'm fellowshipping. When I take the time to bear burdens with my brothers and sisters in the Lord, I'm fellowshipping. Listen to me, saints of God. It's about a whole lot more than casserole. It's about a whole lot more than just joining up somewhere at a hamburger joint and having fries and a hamburger and a diet drink. It's about being together in relationship and sharing this vast life that God has given all of us. You see, we've been called into this fellowship. If you want to be able to have an impetus or some energy or fuel to help you do these one another's, I offer to you Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 this morning. It's in your study guide. Follow along with me. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. There's that whole being what in fellowship? Common, communion, sharing. He goes on to say, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Now, unless you're going to go crazy with that, Paul gave one more verse here. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. This is not an either or proposition. It's and both. My interest and yours. Not yours to the exclusion of mine. Not mine to the exclusion of yours. You will not find a better definition of fellowship than right there. It's you and me together. We were created for this. From the very beginning, it's shown to us in the relationship with God, in the relationship that Adam and Eve enjoyed, in the relationship and the teaching of the New Testament. But what is the obstacle to not only the covenant relationships of God and marriage, but also our community relationships? What's the obstacle? Sin. Sin. We're quick to say that sin separates us from God. And let me be crystal clear this morning. Sin does do that. It will shipwreck your relationship with God. If you start walking in sin and you keep coveting that sin and you keep holding on to it and you keep hiding it and you keep practicing it, I don't know where God draws the line, but God does have a crayon and He does draw the line. Praise God, He does it and not anybody else. Sin separates us from God. It will shipwreck, ultimately, your relationship with God. Marriage, oh, heavens yes. You know sin's going to shipwreck that. You think, husband, that you can be flirting with a woman at work and it not affect your marriage? Give me a break. 
Wife, do you think that you can actually be flirting with an old boyfriend from high school on Facebook and it not affect your marriage? Come on. How delusional are we as a culture? Sin will come into, if sin's allowed into a marriage, it'll shipwreck it. It'll, it'll separate a husband from a wife. It'll cause division. And Satan will use that division to widen the gap and make it wider and wider. And he'll ultimately try to bring destruction to it. Sin separates that. And guess what? Sin also will separate us in our communion with one another. In our fellowship. It takes two people to wound you in your relationships. It takes an enemy to say something bad about you, to demean your character, and someone who you thought was a friend to tell you. Sin separates us. We start dwelling on what so-and-so has said to us and what so-and-so's done instead of forgiving them. And then we get separated in our fellowship with one another. Instead of common Instead of communion, instead of fulfilling our one another's, believe it or not, look for it in your New Testament. The Bible says, as the one another's, forgive one another. See, sin will separate. Let's go back to the beginning to get some clarity on this. Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, and it says this. And they, this is Adam and Eve, so we're just going to say it. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, implying here that this was uh, routine, this was ritual, this was schedule with God, this was time, we would call it today our devotion, our devotional, our time with God. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Why did they do that? We've skipped a little bit of the story, but let me just fill you in real quick. Eve was out taking a walk. The serpent, the Satan in the form of a serpent came to her and tempted her and said, did God really say he caused doubt in the mind of Eve? And guess what? Satan's still trying to cause doubt and use it to divide you today from God. Did God really say? After a little bit, he convinced Eve that it was okay to eat of it. She ate of it. Then she took it to man, to her husband, to the man God had created, and he ate of it also. And now they were filled with the knowledge of good and evil. They saw their nakedness. They were ashamed. Remember, sin brings shame. And they felt shameful. And when they saw the holy God, they heard the holy God coming down in the cool of the day to visit with them. They did what? They ran and hid. Let's continue. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God asked the obvious question when he said this. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded, thee, that, commanded you that you should not eat? Pause right there. The person who originally was given this command was Adam, not Eve. God told Adam that he was not supposed to eat of that. He was not supposed to do it. God asked him a direct question. And like all kids, they get caught by their parents doing something they shouldn't have done. When they're asked a direct question, they do what? Deflect. Okay, I know your kids did. You didn't have to say a man there, but I know your kids did it also because I know kids. Look at what Adam did. He did the same exact thing. Notice this. He engaged in what we've done since the beginning of time, the blame game. God, the woman that you gave me. Adam just told God right to his face, everybody's guilty but me. There is no one to blame your sin on. You did it. You put yourself in that atmosphere. You knew differently. And the truth is, though you may never admit it, when you gave in to that sin, you knew what you were doing was wrong. You've just learned to get comfortable with it because you've had lots of practice. You've learned to justify it because you've ran it through your mind over and over again of how this can be justified. Instead of owning up to it. 
Adam should have owned up to it and said, God, I am sorry. That was an option, folks. That was an option for Adam to say, God, I should have never done it. I still can remember the day when you created me in the garden and you said every tree I can have except for this one tree. And I tried, God, not to do it, but I did do it. I'm sorry, God. That was an option. Just like we have an option today to either sin or not sin. And when we do sin, we still have an option to come to God. Yes. We still have an option to come to Him. Here Adam said, God, the woman, it's all her fault. By the way, God, that you gave me, it's a little bit your fault too, God, right. caused me to eat. And listen to me, the devil doesn't make you do anything. That's right. James 1, again, let's be crystal clear, truth in Scripture. James 1, we sin because we are enticed by our own lust and desire for something else. And instead of helping, asking the Holy Spirit to control that and help us in our life, we give in to it and we partake of it and then we begin to engage with it. All because we wanted to, not somebody else. Your flesh wanted to do it. And instead of crucifying our flesh, we turned it loose. Sin is the obstacle. All the way from the very beginning till now, we still play the blame game today. I preach in a lot of jails and prisons, not as many now, but they are about to open up. I've been getting a few emails from the Kansas Department of Corrections. We're really looking forward to being able to launch back into doing our outreach ministry again there. I can't name in 20 plus years of going in jails and prisons, but maybe two men that I can remember that ever believed that they're in jail because they're supposed to be there. It's the number one obstacle to that ministry in jail and prison is them first accepting responsibility for the fact that they are there because they did something wrong. And the same thing's true with us. You have sin in your life because you allowed it and because you engaged in it. We've got to stop blaming other people. Got to start owning it. Let's look at one more passage of Scripture. You'll need to turn there because I did not give it to you in your study guide. It's kind of a late edition. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. Matthew 5, 23. There's one of my favorite sounds right there when the preacher says, turn with me and I start hearing the rustling of paper. I like that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 through 26. Jesus speaking. And He says this, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar... And there remember that your brother has something against you. And leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. The reason we're bringing this verse into this part of our message this morning is this. Because part of the delusion of the blame game is, and it's entrenched deeply in our culture and in the lives of many fleshly people, is that we believe we're justified in our actions because so-and-so did something wrong to us. And when you come to the altar, this time here at the altar is less, hear me, is less about you coming here to pray to God to straighten sister so-and-so out than it is to ask God to search your heart. Psalms 139, verses 23 through 24. And see if there be any wicked way in me. Here at the altar, you may be asking God to straighten out sister so-and-so, but God's trying to get a hold of your heart. And at this altar, if you realize that you've done something against someone else, that you're to stop the prayer meeting, leave your sacrifice on the altar, go to your brother or sister that you have done wrong, and reconcile. 
Don't tell me how much is, how, that it's 60% their fault in only 40 years. I don't care. God doesn't care. That you go and make an attempt to be reconciled and forgiven. There's nowhere in the scriptures that we can twist that and say, when I come to this altar and God gives me a, because we put this in spiritual terms, a discernment. And so and so's really offended me. I'm supposed to go straighten them out. I'll be the first one to tell you, you are no prophet and God's not sending you that direction. God's concerned about your life being straightened out. Not you straightening out somebody else's. And that's part of that deflection game, that blame game. Because if we, even when we come to the altar, we can get engaged in this. And think that it's about somebody else. But God says at the altar, it's about you. It's about you. Now let me clarify here before we move to our closing moments this morning. And that is this. Let me clarify. This is not someone else's sin being talked about in that Matthew 5, but yours. Got to deal with theirs. This is yours that God's talking about. Also, when someone is wrong in our lives... I want you to notice when there's something, something is wrong in our lives, when we have sin in our lives, let me show you what we do. We avoid relationships. How do we do this? We see it happen all the time. Pastor does, I know, especially in marriage counseling and stuff. You see it all the time. A couple gets to a point where they can't engage in a certain conversation they need to have that's considered a tough conversation. So the husband all of a sudden finds himself having to work late every night because subconsciously he's thinking if he gets home late enough, she'll be too tired to talk about it. She's thinking if she can hurry and get everything done and get to bed and act sleepy before he gets home, then they won't have to talk about it. If we can stay busy with the kids, then we don't have to deal with this issue going wrong in our covenant marriage. If we can say the focus is supposed to be in this season in our life on the grandchildren, then we don't have to do it. And we do what? We avoid the thing that we're supposed to go toward. What did Adam and Eve do when sin entered the picture? What did they do with God? They began to avoid God. Things go wrong in your marriage. You begin to avoid one another. And listen to me. When things are wrong in your life, you begin to avoid your community relationships also. Cut back on your church attendance. You don't come to any of the fellowship dinners. You're no longer encouraging one another, exhorting one another, loving one another, forgiving one another, praying for one another, and involving and engaging yourself in all the activities that God gave us to make us a body of Christ, a family of Christ. And we avoid those things. Satan's going to use your sin against you. There was a little boy, we're going to call him Johnny, because that's what they called me growing up as a kid, and maybe there won't be another Johnny here, and you won't wonder if I'm telling your story. There was a little boy, Johnny, that he would go, he and his sister would go and spend their summers with their grandparents. And uh, they were out there, and uh, Johnny, right before he went there for the summer, for his birthday, he had been given a slingshot. And uh, he's out in the backyard playing with his slingshot, pew, pew, you know, shooting at, you know, cans on a fence post and all this. And he looked up and saw his grandmother's favorite duck walking across the backyard. Loaded it up. <laughs> like, what are the odds? You know, loaded it up. Wow! Little bitty head, right between the eyes, knocked it over dead. Panic settled in. <laughs> Raced over, scooped up the duck, looked around, didn't think anybody was noticing, took it out back behind the barn and, and buried it underneath a pile of wood. Went back in the house. Sitting at the dinner table that night, the grandmother said to them, because they, they, we used to give children chores, so if that's, you may have to Google that later, okay, but the <laughs> kids used to have chores, okay? You don't want to be in my household. I give grandchildren chores. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, I exercise a gift of supervisor a lot. 
So they're sitting at the dinner room table, and the grandmother said, Johnny, it's your turn to clear the dishes off and to wash them tonight. Uh, or said to the sister, Susie, it's your turn to clear the dishes off and wash them tonight. She said, oh, no, ma, no, Grandma, no, Grandma. Uh, Johnny said he was going to do that for me. He said, I did not. And she leaned over to him and said, I saw what you did to the duck. <laughs> He said, yeah, I did say that, Grandma. I was going to do the dishes. I, I, you know, you're right, Grandma. I, yeah, yeah. So he cleared off the table and washed the dishes and put them away and everything, you know. Next day rolls around and it was time to, it was going to be the weekly sweep and dust the house and said to Susie, said, this week's your turn, Susie, to sweep the house and dust. She said, no, 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 no. Johnny said he was going to do it for me. He said he wanted to do it. He said, no, I didn't. And she leaned over and said, remember the duck? <laughs> You know what Johnny did. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I did. I forgot I said that. You know, he said he swept it. This went on for like two weeks. Hey, it's time to bring, it's time to go out to the barn and clean out the stalls. Oh, no, Johnny said he'd do it for me. Remember the duck. And finally, though this had been an option all along. Right. Finally, though he did not have to live like this for two weeks. He ran into the kitchen where his mother, his grandmother was at, grabbed her around her waist, weeping and crying, and said, Grandma, Grandma, I'm so, so sorry. I, I didn't mean to, but I was playing with my slingshot, and I, 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 I shot toward the duck, and I didn't think I'd hit it, but I did, and it killed the duck, and I'm so sorry, and I hit it, and I shouldn't have done it. I'd done it, and I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Grandmother got down on one knee on the floor, and she began hugging him, and then she pulled him back and wiped his tears away a little bit, and then she says this to him. She says, oh, little Johnny, I've known it for two weeks. I just wondered how long you were going to let your sister hold it against you. God knows what you've done. And you have an option. You always have. Thank God. Come to Him. When you come to Him, the Bible says in no wise will He cast you out. He says instead, a broken and a contrite heart, He'll not turn back. The Bible says that when we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. But too many of you are listening to the voice of the devil going, remember X... Remember why? And instead of running to God, to His embrace, you're wrapped up in the jail and prison of shame. And it has caused you to avoid God. To not live for Him the way you should. Most importantly, it's caused impurity in your life, which has begun to separate you from this presence of God that you once knew in your life. Here's your homework. I gave it to you on the study guide, but let's look at it together. Here it is. Number one, is there anyone I've sinned against or offended? If so, I will ask them to forgive me for blank. This is private. I didn't ask you to fill this out and show it to your spouse, your pastor, or the usher at the back door. We're not collecting these at the end of the service. But is there someone you've offended? You've lived in your pride way too long and you know you need to ask for forgiveness. Number two, what one thing can I do now to live out relational living better? I will do blank. What will you do? We don't, you know at Abundant Life Church, we hear the word and do it. Now this is your opportunity to do the word of God. Stop listening to the devil saying, remember X. Instead, run to God. Say, God, I'm sorry. And in that moment, God forgives us of everything and makes us His child. Good news, right? Good news. Good news say amen. amen. Let's pray. Father, we love You, God. It's evident by our devotion to be here this morning, our discipline to come to this service. It's evident, God, in the way I watched people worship You this morning, God, and to call on You. It was obvious by the way we responded to Your gift of the Holy Spirit this morning of tongues and interpretation, God. Father, we want You. Yeah. But we also know, God, we battle our flesh, that yeah. our flesh cries out and craves even for sinful lust and things of this world. 
God, I ask you to give us more of your Holy Spirit and less of our flesh. More of your presence so that we can win over this and conquer this. With eyes closed, it's just this simple. What are you going to do with the message? There was way too much in here that I'm going to, I'm not even going to try to minimize God and put one response to this message because there are many in this message. Not the most exciting message I ever preached, but I do believe since I've been here, one of the most important. So what will you do with it? This is your time to make that decision. It's your time to decide what we're going to do with it. Chris is coming. He's going to lead us in a time of worship together. Not just so you can sing and forget what we just preached about, but to give you an opportunity to have a few more moments to respond to what God has said in His Word today. And I ask you, as one of the pastors at this church, please, I beg you right now, make your response. If you don't make it now, you'll go back out into a sinful, dark, entertaining world that will try to help you to forget so it can keep you separated. Let's not do that. Let's worship God. Stand with me.